Good afternoon and welcome to Every Student Succeeds Act webinar. We have just a few reminders today. The slides will advance automatically throughout for the presentation. Should you need technical assistance, click on the Help button. You are encouraged to submit a question at any time during today's presentation by typing it in the Ask a Question tab and clicking the Submit. In order to stay within our time, we will not be able to answer all questions individually, but all questions will be reviewed to provide further future guidance. If your screen freezes or the slides do not appear to be advancing as they should, please try exiting and restarting the session as it may be an issue with your con connectivity. I will now turn the call over to Abdi Mohamed in Lao Resource Center in the Office of Curriculum and Assessment at the Ohio Department of Education. Please go ahead, Abdi. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar today. Um, I am from the office of uh, Lao Resource Center uh, in the Curriculum and Assessment uh, Center of the Department of Education, and with me here co-presenting are uh, Marianne Motley in the Office of Accountability and Dana Villarreal in the Office of Curriculum and Assessment. We welcome you again. Uh, this is the seventh in a series of webinars the department is hosting to engage with you regarding Ohio's ESSA plan. It is critical for us to get your feedback so Ohio can craft and submit a plan which reflects the needs of Ohio students, educators, and communities. In order for this to happen, we must gather everyone's input. As you know, uh, English language learners are students that we have called earlier uh, limited English proficient students and the name have changed to English language learners, and now ESSA calls them English learner. Um, and today we're discussing about how to include these students in the standards assessment and accountability uh, under ESSA. So the first question is, what are the general requirements for English learners? While English learners have been an emphasis in previous federal law, ESSA places an increased priority on meeting these students' needs. The most significant change requires this, that states include English language proficiency in their accountability frameworks under Title I, the provision that governs accountability for all students. Previously, accountability for growth in language proficiency was limited to Title III, which provides resources for English learner programs. The change raises the profile of English learners within accountability systems and reflects their growing importance and numbers in student achievement determinations. Generally, ESSA defines an English learner as an individual who, among other things, has difficulties in speaking, reading, writing, or understanding the English language that may be sufficient to deny him or her the ability to meet challenging state academic standards. In Ohio, there are approximately 50,000 English language learner students who are served in Ohio school districts and community schools during the 2015-2016 school year. The numbers reflect a steadily growing number of linguistically diverse children and youth who arrive to Ohio schools with language backgrounds other than English. These include Spanish speakers, Somali, Arabic, Pennsylvania Dutch, a dialect of German spoken by the Amish communities of Ohio, Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese, French, Russian, and Tui, among other languages that are most frequently reported home languages. Although Ohio's English learner families have traditionally represented more than 110 languages and vernaculars, many of Ohio's English learner students are children of families who have recently immigrated to the United States. What does ESSA require? There are multiple issues that must be addressed in Ohio's ESSA plan, including technical accountability decisions, identification criteria, and plans for providing services to ELL. Each of these issues will be discussed in detail today. I will turn over to Marianne Motley to discuss accountability framework and decisions. Good afternoon. Under the No Child Left Behind Act, accountability for English learners was captured in two different places. Academic achievement and graduation were addressed as separate subgroups 
in the Annual Measurable Objective Gap Closing Measure, formerly known as Adequate Yearly Progress, or AYP. This accountability continues under the new ESSA Act, although Ohio will need to review and possibly revise the structure of the gap closing measure. In addition, before ESSA, states were required under Title III to develop Annual Measurable Achievement Objectives, or AMAOs, for school accountability determinations. The AMAOs were based on whether English learners first had made progress towards achieving English language proficiency, two, had attained English language proficiency, and three, had achieved goals related to participation and proficiency in state assessments and graduation rate. The Ohio Department of Education, in consultation with the Ohio ELL Advisory Committee, established the AMAO targets with the approval from the U.S. Department of Education. Now, Ohio must set expectations for each English learner to make annual progress towards attaining English language proficiency within the state-determined timeline. This measure of progress towards English proficiency must be included as a graded measure on each school and district report card. Under the original No Child Left Behind Act, states have the ability to exclude newly arrived EL students from proficiency calculations during their first year in an American school. Under the provisions of our ESEA flexibility waiver, states were given some additional options for exempting newer students from proficiency calculations. Those options continue under ESSA, and this is one area where we are seeking feedback from the field. In our state plan, the Ohio Department of Education must decide whether to first include English learner test scores in the accountability determinations only after they've been in U.S. schools for at least 12 months. If we decide to go with this option, students would be allowed to have a one-year exemption from taking the reading and English language arts assessments and would be excluded from proficiency calculations in all subject areas during that first year they're in an American school. Or our second option is to continue with the provisions contained in our 2015 Federal ESEA Flexibility Waiver. This option excludes newly arrived EL students from the proficiency calculations such as the indicators met, the PI score, and the AMO proficiency calculation for the first two years that they are in a school. However, in return for that second year of exemption from the proficiency calculations, students must take all assessments from year one and they must be included in their schools and districts value added calculation during their second year in the school. So now we've got a poll question. It's time for you to weigh in on this issue. So we'll pause for about 15 seconds so you can vote. And the question is which option should Ohio choose? Should we choose to revert back to that one year proficiency exemption where students would be exempt from taking the ELA test in their first year in America or should we continue with the two-year proficiency exemption with the understanding that students must take all tests in year one so that we receive baseline data to include students in the value-added growth calculations in their second year in school? We'll give you just a couple more seconds here to finish voting. All right, well, it looks like overwhelmingly, um, about four to one, we've got the continue with the two-year exemption. So now let's move on. We've got another issue. ESSA gives states one other set of options where we would like your feedback. We know that at some point in a student's education, that student will gain enough proficiency in learning English that he'll be able to exit EL status. Under No Child Left Behind, states were given the option to include what we refer to as former English learners in the EL subgroup for up to two years after they exited EL status. Ohio took advantage of this option, so the current accountability calculations include such students. So in other words, not only are current English learners included, but students up to two years after they exit are filtered into the EL subgroup for accountability purposes. So we're seeking your feedback now because we do, as I said, have a couple of options. 
First of all, should Ohio continue to include students in the English learner subgroup after they exit English learner status? And second of all, if yes, you believe that, um, the next question is for how long should those students be included? And let me offer a couple of additional comments around this. The federal government is now offering states the opportunity to count such students for up to four years. It doesn't mean that four years is the only option, but it would be a maximum of four years. So some stakeholders have suggested that former ELs should be included for the full four years as a way to identify long-term effects of their EL program. They've said that their former students perform just as well on their ELA and math tests as students in their district whose native language is English. And they like the idea of getting credit for their hard work and helping those students to learn English. Others say that the calculation doesn't provide an accurate current description of the status of the students who most recently are receiving support if it includes former EL students. Another consideration is about subgroup size. As you know, we only evaluate a subgroup of students if that group meets the minimum size for evaluation. Right now, that minimum size is 30 accountable students. So although you probably remember from one of the prior ESSA webinars that we also have to review the end size as part of our state plan. So the, the net effect is, though, if we would choose to include students for more years, it will likely increase the number of students in a particular school or district subgroup and may cause some of them to change from not having enough students to evaluate to having a subgroup that is evaluated. So having this additional information, we have another poll question. So let's take about 15 seconds to get your feedback. We want to know, should a student continue to be included in that English learner subgroup after exiting EL status? And if so, for how long should the student be included? So your options for the poll are either to include the students for the last time in the year which they exit, or to include them for one year, two years, three years, or four years after they exit. And again, I'll remind you that the current provision in our flexibility plan includes former EL students in the subgroup for two years after they exit the program. So just a couple more seconds here. We'll go ahead and close the poll. And it looks like by a slim plurality, um, the including for four years after exiting has the most votes with including students for the last time in the year in which they exit uh, and students included for two years running a close second and third. So moving forward, Ohio must develop ambitious long-term goals and measurements of interim progress for all English learners as they work towards gaining English language proficiency and they have to be measured by the state's English language proficiency assessment. The goals and measures must be applied consistently to all English learners in the state and must take into account the student's English language proficiency level. The measures may also consider one or more of the following student level factors at the time the student's identif identified as an English learner. And those things are number one, the amount of time in language instruction educational programs. Number two, the grade level of the student. Number three, the age of the student. Number four, the student's native language proficiency level, meaning is the student otherwise on track in his or her native language. And five, whether the student has had limited or interrupted formal education prior to coming to the United States. At this point, I'd like to turn the presentation back over to, to Abdi, who's going to talk a little more about some of the other changes that are required of ESSA. Thank you, Marianne. Um, to continue, Ohio is also required to develop a consistent process for identifying and reclassifying ELL students as English learners out of the specialized services. Currently, Ohio schools use a two-step process to identify students as English learners as part of the initial school enrollment. The first step is to administer what we, know, what we call a home language survey to determine potential students who may benefit from language instruction support. The home language survey solicits information regarding students' native language backgrounds and exposure to languages other than English. 
The second step is to assess those students who have been identified as having language other than English for English language proficiency using screeners, uh, commercial screeners that provide information about the individual student's strengths and needs in the four domains of listening, speaking, reading, and writing English. This two-step process has been used by Ohio school districts and community schools to properly identify students as English learners or limited English proficient, as was the name before, so that they become eligible for English learner services and accommodation supports for taking state tests. Currently, school districts choose from recommended commercial screeners of English language proficiency. Districts have the option to use a new online screener in school year 2017 that is developed by the Ohio English Language uh, 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 ELPA 21 group uh, as part of the Ohio Language Proficiency Standard in 2017. The new screener would help add to the option of screeners available to Ohio school districts. Additional information about this screener will be forthcoming in future ESSA discussions in the state. The standardization of entry and exit criteria will allow educators in Ohio to better serve students with high rates of mobility for making definition of English learner consistent across the state of Ohio. So this two-step process of the use of home language survey and using screeners across the state of Ohio will help identify the new ELs across the whole state of Ohio as uniform as possible and standardized. New in the ESSA is parental rights and notification. As you know that in the, under the No Child Left Behind, parental rights and notifications were also a requirement. ESSA continues the requirement that school districts, after properly identifying students as English learners, inform parents of the ELLs the educational program to be provided to their children and their right to accept or decline services offered. As in No Child Left Behind, school districts must communicate to parents in a language and manner that's understandable to them about the program of language instruction and support the child will receive, to the right of the parents to choose another program or method of instruction that's available within the district of or school, and three, the right of the parents to decline services. One change in ESSA that that state one one change in ESSA that states that after English learner is identified in the English language instruction program adds to the to the new requirement that parents have the right to retain, to immediately remo remove their child from the English program if they request, um, which was not part of the No Child Left Behind uh, uh, law. So with ESSA, parents now have the right to remove their child immediately from program upon their request. I will pass the baton to my colleague, Adana Villarreal, to continue the discussion on standards assessment and supporting the needs of English language learners in instructional programs. Thank you, Abdi. As we turn to the area of standards and assessments, ESSA requires Ohio to develop English language proficiency standards that are derived from the domains of speaking, listening, reading, and writing. These standards need to address different proficiency levels of English learners and be aligned with the state's academic standards. Last year, here in Ohio, we developed English language proficiency standards that meet federal guidelines and were used in the development of the current English language proficiency assessment, or OELPA. Ohio provides no exemptions for taking the Ohio English language proficiency assessment, and all identified English learners are required to participate. In terms of content area assessments, Ohio requires that Ohio assess English learners in reading or language arts, math, and science assessments, and recommends the use of appropriate accommodations, including assessment in the language and form most likely to yield accurate information on what students know and can do in the content area being assessed. As we turn to this important area of supporting the needs of our English learners, we know that the needs 
must be addressed as part of school and district overall improvement plans. The state-designed long-term goals and measures of interim progress will serve as indicators to support the development of effective language instruction education programs for all our English learners. Ohio school districts continue to serve and meet the needs of English learners with instructional supports and services through some of the following ways. Providing flexibility to parents in choosing a high quality language instruction education program that is most effective for their English learner including English learners with disabilities. As well, providing increased parent participation and engagement and encouraging meaningful communication with parents and families in language that is understandable. And we support the needs of English learners with ongoing and consistent professional development regarding effective instructional strategies that support ESL programs and supports for English learners. With these proposed items and changes, and in consultation with you and other stakeholders, Ohio will develop a state plan that is deeply rooted in the needs of Ohio students and reflects the input of all Ohio stakeholders. Abdi, Marianne, and Donna, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. We appreciate all the information you've shared with us, along with uh, uh, getting the chance to connect with the audience through your poll questions. Now is our time to connect with the audience who have actually uh, submitted questions during your presentation this afternoon. Um, we've received a number of questions this afternoon, and due to the number of those who have submitted, unfortunately, we'll, we will not be able to answer each one individually but uh, please be assured we will be reviewing all submissions this afternoon so we can continue to inform the Ohio plan and provide you with future guidance. In addition, if you have further questions after our session, please feel free to email us at essa at education.ohio.gov. And of course, all the latest information plus previous webinars is available at our website listed. So to get started, in terms of the end size, for this subgroup, is has one been decided and, and how would that be determined? Moving forward, one has not been determined yet. We currently use, under ESEA, a subgroup size of 30 for the AMOs. Um, so anybody who has 30 accountable students. But some of you may have logged in and watched another webinar where we talked about the N size and the fact that the new state plan has to review what size a student group would be for accountability purposes. So we did seek some feedback already, and we will be doing a number of regional meetings that you will see in a moment here popping up on your screen where we're seeking additional feedback. And one of the things that we'll be talking about as we're trying to roll our state plan together is what is a fair number, both statistically and to ensure that every student is served, what is a fair number for accountability calculations? So it may change, and we don't have a predetermined number set at this point. We are still seeking feedback. Thank you, Marianne. And to follow up, uh, there is not a predetermined number. Is there a predetermined grade level where this, could, where this could be impacted? So for the AMOs, obviously we assess students in grades three through eight in English language arts, and then again once in high school, and right now we're using the Geometry and Integrated Math 2 and ELA 2 tests for high school accountability. So it would be all students in those grades as far as the reading ELA and math proficiency. Now for graduation, we use the four-year graduation rate, and it's only those students that would be in whatever the four-year cohort is. So for this year, it's the graduating class of 2015 that's being evaluated. And, and again, I want to also emphasize that while we still need to include um, ELA, math, and graduation, our calculation itself is another thing that we'll be seeking input on because we do have some options for tweaking it. Um, so we may come back, be coming back to you to ask about options there. So as, a, as you mentioned, the federal waivers that, ex, that expired this month for ESEA do you consider the continuation to be the transition year? 
Yes, for 2016 and 2017, we are continuing in a transition period as we work towards our state plan. So once um, the student takes the OALPA, the, uh, will they be tracked for that year and then the following year? Yeah, Abdi, can you take that? The question is, once they are exited from the EL program, would they take the OALPA? And the answer is no. Uh, a student who is exited from the program is no longer ELL. They are included in the cohort, but they do not take the annual English language proficiency assessments because they, are, they have already been found to be proficient. Right, and, and if we do choose an option similar to what we have now, they would still be included in the limited English proficient or now moving forward called the EL subgroup for proficiency and accountability purposes. But again, that would be using our state's English language arts and math assessments, not the OELPA test. That's correct. When can teachers expect to have the OELPA results? Because this is the development year and that we are still continuing with the process of uh, finalizing the data. We're hoping that the data will be available sometime during the fall. Uh, that is, um, uh, hope, we're hoping that sometime in uh, late September, October, we're hoping that the data will be available, but there's no uh, accurate date that was provided to us by our vendors. But we're hoping that this data will be available sometime in the fall. Abdi, can the home language survey be more specific to avoid students being misidentified? That's a, a very good question. Um, the, the home language survey is used throughout the, st the state of Ohio and throughout the nation to identify the, the language backgrounds of ELLs at home, but it's administered differently in different states and different schools by different uh, staff members. So what ESSA requires is for the state to come up with a uniform, statewide, standardized me measure of entry and exit of ELLs. This includes um, standardizing the home language survey, and we are now in the process of thinking about ways to standardize that system and make sure that all ELs in Ohio, whether they are in the northeast or the north northwest of Ohio, are provided the same system of entry for ELL program as well as an exit criteria for getting out of the program. I mean, do you anticipate an alternate assessment being developed for English learners? And that's yes, we do um, anticipate the development and, and ha require the development of an alternate assessment for are English learners with um, severe disabilities, severe cognitive disabilities. This is in discussion um, within the consortium, uh, ELPA 21, to which we are in Ohio are members. Um, so this is in development over the next couple of years. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Are you able to provide uh, more information on providing instructional materials in the English learners' uh, native language? Well. As you know, there are 110 languages that Ohio ELs speak, and um, uh, of course, Spanish uh, is the largest um, a group of, of languages that are spoken by Ohio ELs, and there are, there are numerous resources that, that we have in the Spanish language, but we are developing more resources for other languages uh, in Ohio. Um, uh, as, as we go into the, the implementation of ESSA, we are required to make sure that Ohio ELLs are provided uh, in instructional support and materials um, in their langu in native language as much as possible and feasible. Donna, would you like to add something? Yes, with the ESSA, um, we are given the um, encouragement to develop 
materials in the native or home languages students, but this needs to be connected also with the program that is being implemented by the school district. So a program that uses materials in the home language needs to be well planned. These materials are purchased with awareness of the demographics and the, the population that is being served, as well as the type of instruction that's delivered using these, as well as the qualified personnel who are using the native language, home language materials. But of course, materials that communicate to parents and translations and interpreters continue to be part of the ESSA, as well as from the current No Child Left Behind. Thank you very much. Is there a limit to how many English learners an ESL teacher uh, can have in the classroom? No, there is no limit, uh, but it is a determined locally. Uh, of course, a, 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 it has to be a teacher-student ratio and, and allows uh, a teacher to be able to meaningfully provide instruction to students who generally um, have more challenges than, than, than other students. So I would say that there's no specific um, teacher-student ratio for ELL uh, teachers and students. But of course, uh, the the smaller the number, the better that teachers are able to provide meaningful um, uh, interactions and supports to English language learners. Thank you, Abdi. Can you provide some guidance to schools um, if a parent uh, requests that a student not participate um, in in such a test? Um, with with no child left behind, we had a process where parents refuse services or refuse testing. And parents were provided a refusal form for both. And a student is uh, either not tested or not serviced. But the student remains as an EL, as an English language learner, once they have been identified, until such a time that that student takes the, the state assessment for English language proficiency and passes that test and are exited. Otherwise, they will remain in the program until they graduate from high school and, are remain, and, and remain as ELL. With ESSA, there's a minor change in that process where it says that the student can be, should be removed immediately upon the request of the parent. We don't know what that means. We are still in consultation with uh, our colleagues in, 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 the, in, 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 in the federal government as well as in other states as to whether that immediate removal means that they are removed from the program but still are identified as English learner, or that the label ends there and the student is removed when the parent requests. So that is something that we have to uh, um, uh, look for a, um, an, a final answer. Uh, this is what other states are all uh, addressing the, the, the question. What does it mean to immediately remove a student from an ELL program. Does that mean that the label goes with them? Or does it mean that the student is removed from the class or the test, but remain as an EL in the program? Great, thank you, Abdi. And as a follow-up to that, if a parent does not accept the English language learner services, does that change their EMA status in terms of their LEP? I uh, thought I addressed uh, part of that question, which, which is that if the definition under ESSA for removing a child immediately becomes that the label no longer exists, then that would remove the child from the uh, EMAS code of, of English language learner. However, if the, the law continues the interpretation of no child left behind, which was that the parent has the right to remove the child from either the testing or the services, but would remain the student as an EL as long as they are in the program and show proficiency in English, then, then that student will remain in EMAS as an, as an EL student. That has to be determined, and we, we need to do some further investigation on that. Great. Thank you very much. And it looks like we have time for just a couple of more questions uh, before we conclude this afternoon. Now, while providing students with instructional materials in their native language, should students be permitted to submit their work uh, to their teachers in their native language. Thank you, Donna. This is Donna, yes. Um, it's a very specific question um, that goes into the area of accommodations on um, how we can um, provide opportunities for our students to express what they know uh, and if it's in the home language. 
that is one option, although there are a number of strategies uh, that do not require use of the home language where students can be expressing what they know, their understanding. This would be need to be part of the process of deciding how students could submit. If a student is submitting a response in the home language, it needs to be considered uh, how that response will be assessed and evaluated. And that might be done via rubrics, but certainly the district would need to, or the teacher would need to assemble a way of interpreting and providing uh, feedback on the student's uh, submission, be it written or verbal. So yes, it's possible. Thank you, Donna. And this will be our last question uh, this afternoon. And has there been any consideration to having multiple proficiency levels within this option for English learners? Multiple proficiency levels in the English language acquisition. Uh, the, the current proficiencies that we have are in, in, under No Child Left Behind, we had uh, proficient, um, intermediate, advanced, beginner, and now under OELPA, we have a student that is proficient, students that are progressing, and students that are emerging. So we have three categories of proficiency under the, the Ohio English Language Proficiency Assessment, which the, the first category is, is uh, emerging, ELL student. The second category is progressing English language learner. And the third category is proficient uh, English learner, which would exit if we determine that the exit criteria is uh, proficiency, then, then that would be the exit. Historically, we had uh, students that, that were uh, advanced and proficient who were on a trial mainstream that were proficient and those who were exited from the program that had the highest level of proficiency. Uh, but for OELPA, we have only three categories, which are proficient, progressing, and emerging. We want to thank our presenters this afternoon, Abdi, Marianne, and Donna. We really appreciate your time and the information you shared with us. Uh, before we conclude today, we want to make sure to remind everyone here that all of our uh, previous webinar sessions are posted at education.ohio.gov slash ESSA, but we want to encourage you to join us at our remaining sessions, including the one next week where we're going to discuss the report card summit of rating, desegregation requirements, and the re required report card indicators. And we're very excited because this, tonight we're actually kicking off our series of regional meetings in Columbus. So um, if you see uh, your region, uh, we really encourage you to come out and, and connect with us in person uh, to share your feedback about Ohio's Every Student Succeeds Act plan. And uh, if you go to our website, the full list of locations is there along with links to RSVP to each of them. So we really appreciate everyone joining, this, joining us this afternoon. Thanks again to our presenters. This concludes our webinar. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for participating.